Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today with an amazing session related to the legal elements of fraud. Today we have with us a global expert who's going to guide you over you know, all the legal elements that you need to think about when you are handling fraud investigations so you can be successful. With that, I give the mic to Mr. Michael. Let me start at the beginning and explain that when I was approached to do this class, um, I thought about it before I accepted because typically I would expect this class to be taught by an attorney. That doesn't mean that I don't know as much as many attorneys because I've been practicing a really long time. And so I agreed to do this. And what I'm going to do is pretty much walk you through every relevant element of a fraud investigation that may or may not end up in a court of law, at least in the United States. And much of the focus will be on United States statutes and regulations because that's primarily where my practice is, but the concepts apply pretty much internationally and every international investigation I've done has echoed that result. So next slide. The key to a any investigation is that you have to begin with the end in mind. I just need to, excuse me, I have to let somebody out of a room. They say sometimes lawyers, they are always manipulating the facts. So there's a story of uh, Two lawyers, they went to a Starbucks and uh, they decided to order coffee and then every one of them decided to, to go and uh, uh, open his bag and eat his sandwich. Then the manager of Starbucks came and he said, uh, this is not allowed. Based on the policy of Starbucks, you, can eat, you can't eat your sandwich. So they exchanged sandwiches and they continued. So in that way, they are not eating their own sandwiches. And this is what will happen with lawyers. Sometimes lawyers, they have the ability to manipulate the rules and the facts. And when you are handling fraud cases, you need to understand exactly how can you handle it properly so you will be able to do it in the proper way. Okay, please continue. Terrific. You have to begin with the end in mind. Stephen Covey, who wrote The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, really stressed this concept. And there's nothing harder than uh, in forensics than knowing what the solution needs to be what it needs to look like, because that's the real end. What are the, what's the end game in any fraud investigation or any forensic investigation? Indictment, a plea compromise and or conviction, recovery and or restitution of ascertainable damages, possible imprisonment, revenge, and in a per perfect world, taking that and creating a form of prevention, particularly when it comes to white collar fraud or any other white collar crime uh, or um, any sort of financial statement fraud. Typically, one or more of these, uh, these objectives, these end results will be considered and sought at the same time. Can they, the question is, can they be sequential or concurrent? Concurrent means that you go down those paths simultaneously. Sequential means that you build a series of results and you build that into your case theory. Next slide. Not every investigation requires a trial but those objectives need to be determined in consultation with the attorney based upon the jurisdiction. In the United States, there are 50 states and uh, three or four other jurisdictions. Uh, international, you have to look at the laws of the, in the, the jurisdiction where, where the crime occurred or where the assets are located that you're trying to recover. So jurisdiction matters. What are the alternatives to trial? alternative dispute resolution, which is mediation or arbitration, perhaps just settlement discussions, perhaps just recovery, 
And that leads you to what a, the trial decision tree is, which is beginning from case intake all the way down through trial. What are the steps? What are the dates? What are the objectives? Who are the people? What are the variables? What is the geography? What is the intelligence? And deciding who on each team plays which role and when. And that leads you to the real question is where does it start anyway? Next slide. It starts the way it always does. The expert gets a call and it's a waterfall of, of information at one time. And it's typically late in the game. And I'll circle back to that concept in a couple of minutes. The waterfall is first drip is the commission of a crime. The second element is determining what the predicate fact is. Now there are two predicates. One is a predicate fact and the other is a different kind of predicate that only deals with uh, penalties in trial. But the predicate fact is determining what occurred that, that arose from the actual crime that meets the requirements of the statute or regulation. Typically, this will start with somebody who's suspicious, perhaps as a confidential informant, perhaps there's a whistleblower, uh, perhaps there's a conspiracy, there may be a blackmailer. Regardless of what it is, there is a suspicion that rises to the surface that then is addressed by, in the case of, of a white collar crime, corporate management typically, in the case of individual acts, uh, criminal acts, it could be uh, of specific individuals based on observation, uh, other evidence that may or may not be significant enough to go to trial. Suspicion then leads to discovery, which is a formalized process in every jurisdiction as to when and how discovery occurs and what is admissible in, in trial before what's called a trier of fact. A trier of fact, at least in the United States, is a judge and or jury, because those individuals are the ones who will determine what the facts are, and that's why they are a trier of fact. Once we've done discovery, we can then make ascertain, ascertain what the damages in any given case are. Damages can be physical damages in certain cases, particularly felonies, or financial damages, or they could be damages to reputation, damages to source of income. So damages are ascertained typically by an expert, and they're argued by the attorney. Then the concept of evidence comes up. Evidence is defined in by law it's defined by common law it's defined by statute and we will go through each of these definitions as we go through the 50 minutes together then we come to suspects and um, that's self-evident what they are but we'll talk about that too and then that leads to the investigation and all investigations no matter what the crime is no matter what the civil issue is all begin the same way. And we'll talk about that. Next slide. So the beginning point for anybody who belongs to ACFA is pretty much your entry into the uh, issue before the courts. Timing is everything and it's typically late because attorneys, particularly in, in the current economy and the economy as it has been for the past several years, are waiting later and later into the, the progression of the case to retain an expert in order to save clients uh, substantial expenses for as long as possible. It also helps attorneys get paid along the way because there's not a second uh, professional being paid. So, it is literally experts a go-go. You may not be the only expert who's talked to. Sometimes you will be spoken to, you'll be consulted to specifically cons uh, conflict you out of a case so that you cannot be approached by the other party. 
just so that you understand how that works institutionally, Walt Disney uh, of Disneyland and Disney World, in every city where they have a, in a, a park, they pretty much send an annual retainer to every good attorney in that geography so that that attorney is conflicted out and cannot be retained in a lawsuit against Disney. It's an interesting uh, strategy. All major corporations do it. But in most cases, if there is an expert that somebody does not want to be on the other side, if the expert is not cautious, they can be conflicted out because they'll be approached, information will be shared, and that would preclude them from being retained by the other side, whether or not they're, they're hired by that first point of communication. The first interview is of the attorney. And what's important to understand is if, unless you are in law enforcement or in certain branches of the military, your communication processes are not interrogations, they are interviews. And there's a huge distinction. So your first interview though, is of the attorney. And depending on whether or not you know the attorney will determine what the tone of that interview is. What is important and critical is that you must be able to identify who the client is. And I'll circle back to this too, because this is relatively new in the United States, uh, at least since 9-11. And knowing who your client is, is the client the injured party? Is the client the individual who's being accused of causing damages? Is it the attorney? Is it going to be perhaps a third party, particularly in class action suits in the United States? Is it going to be the court? Will you be retained by the judge? Identifying that client from the very beginning is what is critical in managing the client relationship and managing client expectations. Managing client expectations through effective communication and establishing appropriate communication boundaries not only helps the client feel more comfortable with the expert as well as the entire professional team, but also maintains the concept of privilege and confidentiality as it may be established in whatever um, whatever jurisdiction you are uh, working in and whatever level of court you are going to be trying the case in. Case theory is something that most litigating attorneys don't want to tell you at the beginning. And some, depending on how they practice, won't even have a theory of their case until you have finished your work. And then they will build their theory after you're done. I will always ask an attorney that first meeting, what's your theory of the case? Because I want to know if the attorney has, has spent time on it and understands management of expectations and then build from there. And I will ask it frequently throughout the case leading up to trial so that I understand that I'm on the same page moving towards the same objectives as the attorney based on theory and the expectations of the client who will pay my bill. What's also critical is how you write your contract. Oftentimes, more times than not in the United States anyway, uh, these contracts are referred to as engagement letters which have no legal definition. They meet all the requirements of, by statute of an enforceable contract, and that's the language that should be used for those of you in the United States. What, how is the contract written? How are the fees specified? Are you getting evergreen, and I'll explain what that means, evergreen retainers at the very beginning to protect your independence and to protect your firm from losing money on, an, on a trial or an engagement? And then of course, timing. Understanding what the docket is, understanding what the court timing is, understanding how each type of case flows through the whichever level of court, whether it's the Supreme Court of the United States or down to the lowest level local court uh, in a county in the United States or any other uh, 
local jurisdiction. Next page. Okay, just uh, to clarify, because I'm getting so many questions here, Mr. Michael, he's speaking about how can you handle legal case if you are an expert in the fraud case, not if you are the investigator inside your organization, just to clarify for everyone asking questions. Well, no, it, 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 it works the same way for internal investigators, because internal investigators are moving towards the same identification of an issue, recovery, prosecution, perhaps defense in certain circumstances. Uh, the objectives are the same. The dynamics play out differently um, because, and, and the, where the only difference is, is it comes down to confidentiality and privilege. If someone is an employee of a party, an internal investigator, as opposed to a, an external expert. Does that clarify it a little bit? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Because we are getting some questions. They want to, some of them, they want to understand how to handle it as an expert. Some of them, they want to understand from internal investigation. So these are their questions. The elements of, of, of fraud and the investigation of fraud are uh, common across the board because the burden of proof is the same. And the technology and the procedures you use in getting there is typically the same. Um, where I'm going to be focusing, because we were talking about elements of, of fraud, understanding how to, how to investigate a case, prosecute a case, requires that you have common knowledge that applies in all situations of forensics, which is why the next topic is, is burden of proof, at least in the United States. At any rate, in every country, in every jurisdiction, in every state, there are burdens of proof. And burdens of proof are such that the courts require you to be able to accumulate reliable evidence that will help you, help the court, the trier of fact, understand what is the truth, what are the consequences of the action or even the inaction that caused the damage, what is the extent of the damage, what is the duration of the damage, and what can be recovered or if it comes to a criminal case, which fraud cases are criminal cases, sentencing guidelines, which involves a, a predicate offense different from the uh, predicate act. There are the, the dictionary about law in the United States is called Black's Law Dictionary. Uh, right now it's on the 11th edition that just came out uh, this year. And it's about so seven inches wide, weighs at about seven pounds. And it has all the definitions that the courts recognize. When you look up the word evidence, because evidence applies in both internal and external investigations, evidence has more than a hundred types of evidence that are defined. The basic definition of evidence that you must know as any investigator, internal or external, is that evidence is something including testimony documents and tangible objects that tends to prove or disprove the existence of an alleged fact that is universal to all investigations, regardless of cause, regardless of geography. Evidence is also a collective mass of things, especially testimony and exhibits for trial. An exhibit for trial is something that you're going to show to the judge or the jury to support the legal argument of your case. So it's the collective mass of things presented before a tribunal in a given dispute. And evidence is something you find rather than something you create. Anything you create is a record or a document. What you find is evidence. Next page. Okay, is this the next page or was there one before? 
This is the next one. Okay. The types of evidence, the, the, the classifications of evidence, while the name may vary, applies in all investigations, internal and external. No evidence is just, there's no trace of evidence whatsoever. There's no writings. There's no, uh, no one's heard anything. No one's seen anything. There's no measurable uh, damage or harm. A scintilla of evidence, which is, tip, which is used as common language in all investigations, is any evidence of all, at all, whether uh, the common terminology is, or is, is a spark or trace of evidence. It is the initial slightest clue. It can be a behavior. It can be a document. It can be something tangible. It can be a video, it can be a tape recording, it can be a uh, misplaced password to a, a file. It's the smallest measurable evidence going forward. Once you accumulate enough scintilla of evidence, you can start to approach reasonable suspicion that is foundationally dependent on specific or particular facts or reasons. So you've conducted an investigation, you've got some facts, you've got some ideas, you've got some uh, shared information, you have some intelligence. It is beyond guessing, it is beyond intuition, and it can be verbalized, you can explain your reasonable suspicion and justify it based on what's been accumulated to this point. One of the most important uh, characteristics of a good investigator is intuition. The skills of investigation can be taught, they can be learned. Intuition is something each of us is born with and you can learn how to use the intuition you have better than you do normally, but you can't grow or develop or create more intuition. The key is how much of the intuition that you have that God gave you, can you apply to any given circumstance? And that is what allows you to get to reasonable suspicion faster than somebody else. Next slide. Burden of proof is always jurisdictionally context sensitive. So whether you're an internal investigator or an external investigator, your burden of proof is going towards the same concept. It is based on the legal system in which your client or your employer or the attorney you're working for or the court that you're working for exists. And those rules of procedure and rules of evidence that apply then and there not some other uh, geography. Legal sufficiency is a term that you need to know as any kind of an investigator, because whatever you're doing needs to be considered legally sufficient. Legal sufficiency is the lowest burden of guilt. It's the lowest threshold for guilt. It is the easiest to prove because all it is, is somebody says, I know something about what somebody did. And based on what that allegation is, the investigator can identify a specific law, a specific statute, a spe specific uh, regulation, or even a, a specific uh, code of ethics, that if the allegation were true, would violate a specifically identifiable statute. Doesn't matter whether it's true or not, that's not what legal sufficiency is. It's whether or not you can find a way to move it forward in a court of law. That's critical to all internal investigations because internal investigations to detect fraud are based on the establishment of legal sufficiency first. Probable cause is the next level in terms of uh, level of guilt, a finding of guilt. Probable cause, if you've all watched any one of the law and order shows that are, that are 
shown all over the world or any police procedural show, you will always hear about the term probable cause. Probable cause exceeds legal sufficiency because probable cause has determined that there are reasonable and trustworthy facts and circumstances contained in that allegation. So now we're beyond, doesn't matter if it's, if it's true or not, we're now to the point where what we're being told, what we have seen initially, whether it's evidence or it's verbal or it's just intelligence that you've developed, would lean to be able that a reasonable person would think that a crime was committed, a fraud was committed. In the United States, this is derived from the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution of the United States based on unreasonable searches and seizures. Next slide. This is what the Fourth Amendment says, and it would, will not have any bearing except for context for you as an investigator to understand. And I'll just go through it very quickly until we get to probable cause. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. In other words, law enforcement cannot just, without probable cause, enter a residence or stop someone or search someone or their vehicle, for example, shall not be violated and no warrant shall issue, but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation, that means someone can testify as to what they've discovered and particularly describing the place to be searched and the person or things to be seized. That's what probable cause is. It is the first step toward seeking justice in most crimes. Next slide. The burden of proof as we go further. In the United States, there is something called preponderance of proof. This is typically a non-criminal lawsuit where you don't have a beyond a reasonable doubt. It is the jury gets to vote. And if 51% vote for conviction, then that's all that's required. It's based on a preponderance. So it's a superiority in weight of the evidence that the investigator has accumulated, the importance or the influence of that evidence in determining guilt or innocence. Evidence must be clear and convincing. A firm belief that the allegations are true based on the evidence that the thing to be proved is highly probable or reasonably certain. So we've got gone beyond pr a probable cause to the concept of clear and convincing because in the United States, there's something called reasonable doubt that applies to criminal cases. And what this means is that the jury must decide unanimously that guilt exists. If a single juror cannot reach the state of conviction, there is no conviction and there may be a retrial or the, or the case will be dropped. It depends. But reasonable doubt is a term and this term is misunderstood by nearly everyone who's not an attorney. It's probably pretty well understood, but not easily defined. And from a famous case, in, um, including uh, Nathaniel, Daniel Webster, it is the state of case which after the entire comparison and consideration of all the evidence, whatever you as an investigator have accumulated, leaves the minds of jurors in that condition that they cannot say they feel an abiding conviction to a moral certainty of the truth of the charge. So if, they, if the juror, the finder of fact, cannot absolutely say, based on my moral values, based on what I've seen and what I've heard, I am 100% convinced that this occurred, then there has to be a finding of not guilty. Next slide. I mentioned a pre predicate before, so let's talk about a predicate again. A predicate requires a defined crime. You as investigators need to know what predicates are and what fraud is. 
The definition of fraud in 1979, when Blacks was in its fifth edition, said it was all multifarious means, which means evil intentioned means, which human ingenuity can devise and which are resorted to by one individual to get an advantage over another by false suggestions or suppression of the truth. That's what fraud was in 1979. This was the standard for court. You'll notice that it talks about a single person. It talks about motivation. It talks about ingenuity. This single statement defines the fraud triangle. Next slide. So 30 years later, the definition of fraud is a knowing misrepresentation of the truth or concealment of a material fact to induce another to act to his or her detriment. Big difference. Uh, the emotions have been removed. The concept of materiality has been introduced and the concept of omission or commission have been introduced here as well as the concept of concealment and truth. So that's the current definition. These definition, legal definitions can change over time and they do. This is the current definition of fraud. It's one each investigator, internal or external, needs to know. Next slide. Next slide. Let's talk about those, those items in the list that I did earlier where I said we'd circle back to them. The definition of crime is any act that law makes punishable. And it's a breach of duty that's treated as subject matter of a criminal proceeding. Very straightforward. All fraud investigations are going toward that as ascertaining the existence of a crime that violates a specific law that is punishable by prosecution. Next slide. Predicate fact, as opposed to a predicate offense. A predicate fact is any fact which a pre, uh, from which a presumption or inference arises. And it's a fact that's necessary to the operation of the evidentiary rule. So predicate fact is anything that satisfies the concept of being evidence and to the accumulation of evidence that can prove the existence of this predicate fact. And it is any assumption or intuitive conclusion that creates that, that conclusion. It is different from a predicate offense because a predicate offense is used only in criminal sentencing. Uh, the best example of a predicate offense I can give you is in federal law in the United States, particularly if it involves the government and the fraud. A person, when they're sentenced to prison, or to restitution, repaying money, is not sentenced based on what the, the crime they actually committed, but they are sentenced based on their intention to commit fraud. So there's a calculation that's done prior to sentencing after conviction, where the, uh, both the prosecution and defense will compute how much the person could have stolen if they had not been caught. And that's what a predicate offense is. Next slide. So we have one question. They are saying, is it similar to anti-money laundering? It, we consider it uh, in, in the same way or anti-money laundering is different? What was that term? Laundry? Related to money laundering? Do we consider Money laundering, it? yes. It, that would relate to money laundering if it's a federal offense, if it's, if it's at a federal level. Um, there are two types of money laundering, basically. One involves currency and, and cash equivalents. The other is the most fastest growing, and that's called trade-based money laundering, which, which is an entirely different scheme. And uh, is very, that's very difficult to catch because it involves sales and tangible assets. But yes, if the objective was to steal more than the person got away with before they were arrested, then that calculation in determining the sentencing by the judge would include a calculation of what they intended to get away with. And 
People like me who are hired are often hired by the defense and the prosecution to make that specific calculation, either to try to get a person a reduced sentence, but there's no, they're not, they weren't possibly ever going to steal what, what the government, the prosecutors have said, or by the, for prosecution saying, your honor, jury, you have no idea how much this person had projected in their minds what they were going to steal. And this is what the real number was. Oh, it may be a hundred times more before they, they were stupid enough to be caught, but that's what the way it works. Next slide. Suspicion as a term, it's apprehension or imagination of the existence of something wrong. In other words, intuition based only on inconclusive or slight evidence. In other words, it might be a scintilla of evidence or possibly even no evidence. So we've got two of those previous definitions coming to play here. No evidence and scintilla of evidence. So suspicion is nothing that you can prove, but it's enough to motivate someone to take an investigatory action whether it's intern internally in a company or it's externally uh, as a result of, of uh, an external investigation, perhaps by law enforcement, uh, a suspicious spouse, or uh, an, another uh, financial relationship. Next slide. Discovery. All investigations, internal and external, inf involve discovery, discovery of evidence, discovery of financial transactions, discovery of communications. So discovery is the act or process of finding or learning something that was previously unknown. But it may have been, there may have been suspicions that led to the act of discovery. All jurisdictions have rules of procedure and rules of evidence. They all control discovery in terms of how you can conduct discovery, when you can conduct discovery, how it can be presented to the trier of fact in a courtroom or to an employer. And it needs to be watched very carefully because it is very easy to uh, breach a law. When I first started out uh, and I was working with a law enforcement agency, uh, we could at that point in time gain evidence merely by producing our credentials for a bank. Um, it eventually got to the point where no, you need to get a subpoena or a warrant to get information. So you need to know what the laws are for discovery so that what you get is admissible as, as evidence. Because if you produce evidence that you breached by breaching the rules of discovery, you will find you have no evidence and you will have a very unhappy judge and you will get a very bad result. Next slide. Damages. We're talking financial damages. Financial damages can arise from natural disasters acts of war, um, acts of individuals, negligence, gross negligence. And so this is money that a plaintiff wants a court to order to be paid to someone as compensation for that injury. The injury can be physical, it can be mental, can be emotional, it can be damage to a company's goodwill, it can be damage to a company or an individual's reputation. So damages, it can be damage to somebody's ability to earn future income. If someone is fired for lack of cause, that could create a damage if the person's not reemployed or cannot be employed in this at the same level. Damage is anything you want it to be if you can prove it in, in a court of law. Next slide. Suspects. It's a pretty straightforward definition. Anybody believed to have committed a crime or offense. Next slide. Investigation. This is 
important to know. All of these definitions, if you are an investigator, if you are a forensic investigator, if you're a fraud examiner, whatever it may be, you need to have these, you need to have conversational language where you can use these terms in the natural flow of your conversation, the natural flow of your writing, the natural flow of testimony, either in deposition or trial, because it will establish your understanding to a third party and your professional competence to a third party. That is vital to your success. It's vital to your survival in the fraud investigation environment. So an investigation is <clears throat> merely inquiring into a matter systematically. The key to this is the word systematically. It is not based on how you're feeling. It's not based on uh, what you think watching somebody and thinking you can read their body language, but most of us really can't. Um, those of us who are trained can send false body language signals to somebody who they think is reading it. It is systematically, it, you have a process, you have steps, you have quality control, you're consistent with the laws, you're consistent with, with the statutes, you're consistent with the regulations, you're consistent with, with jurisdictions, and you're consistent with your moral values and your core values as an investigator. All investigations begin as, in, as exercises in exclusion. An investigator's first task is always to eliminate every possible person who could not have committed the crime and then focus on the remaining pool of possible suspects. So every investigation, no matter what it is, begins with identifying immediately everyone who couldn't be a, a party to it and then focusing on those who could be. Next slide. The elements of fraud are consistent in all types of fraud. Financial statement fraud, property fraud, misrepresentation, you name it, it's all there, what you have. And you'll recognize that there are elements of the fraud triangle in here. You've got motivation and opportunity, two corners of the fraud triangle. It contains repetitive acts. That would include rationalization from the fraud triangle. Elements of fraud include witness statements, people being asked and telling what they know. Fraud always involves concealment. It typically involves collusion. And those from, of you in the United States have heard enough use of the word collusion in the past couple of years to last a lifetime, but there is often collusion. The frauds that last the longest often have collusion, but certain types of collusion are the shortest lived frauds because as Benjamin Franklin said, three people can keep a secret if two of them are dead. Because the minute you have collusion, you have the possibility and the increased likelihood that someone will tell. So that's, those are your elements of fraud. Next slide. You, you have to understand what the term prosecution means. Prosecution is based on your national laws, your, your local laws, and territory statutes, where, wherever you are practicing, wherever you're working. So prosecution is determined by rules. In the United States, one of the major pro prosecutory uh, tools is what's called RICO, which is the Racketeering Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act. Uh, this was created to uh, dismantle uh, organized crime in the United States, and it essentially did particularly in the Northeast of the United States and uh, state of New York and Pennsylvania and New Jersey, uh, it for the most part dismantled most organized crime. RICO is a very easy case to make because it involves collusion at its lowest level. 
which is why it was designed to fight organized crime. Uh, you may have or may not have heard of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in the United States. This is a, a law that is prosecuted frequently and involves uh, basically bribes being paid to uh, officials of foreign countries for, uh, for economic or business advantages. Bankruptcy fraud, if your country has a bankruptcy statute, uh, in the United States, bankruptcy is where someone who can't pay their debts is given a clean slate. Uh, their debts are forgiven for either completely or, or for uh, a fraction of the amount owed, and they're able to then go on with their lives. Bankruptcy fraud is, it occurs frequently. Uh, the False Claims Act is also in the United States law and involves uh, false claims to insurance companies typically for Medicare fraud or healthcare fraud uh, on, a, on a wide scale. Mail and or wire fraud is exactly what it sounds like. Any kind of fraud that's conducted by telephone, by mail, by uh, internet is mail or wire fraud. And as I mentioned to you, uh, trade-based money laundering, um, that is the fastest growing uh, money laundering operations in the world. It's international and it's extremely difficult to discover. Next slide. The, there, there's a history and there's also a present to fraud investigations. The universal assumption that is that people will make errors while committing a crime. That concept that there's no such thing as a perfect crime still exists today. The, the process of detecting fraud and defalcations, defalcations being an, a legal term for misrepresentation as well as fraud in, in and of itself, hinges on being able to identify and locate suspects, the identity of suspects. It involves locating discovery, discovery locating, documenting and preserving evidence while preserving the chain of custody. Not every country has a chain of custody statute uh, every every jurisdiction, jurisdiction in the United States does, and that involves preserving evidence in a pristine state so that it is exactly as it was discovered, exactly as it was left by the criminal. And for those of us who don't work for law enforcement agencies or the military, uh, fraud investigators rarely assist in detaining a, a suspect. Next slide. The process, again, involves interviewing, not interrogating, suspects and witnesses, recovering assets, preparing sound criminal case exhibits or civil case exhibits for prosecution, prepare the better cases for the defense than they would have had otherwise, and then testifying in deposition, hearing, or actual trial. That's the, the, the bottom line, and that's where your reputation is made as an, as an investigator. Next slide. What you must know in the United States, and I would tell you to take this list and trans, tr lay it over as a template into the countries in which you work. United States constitutional law, understanding the legal differences between countries, particularly with international investigations. Uh, a lot of investigations in, involve Panama, so we've had to learn those. Uh, understanding criminal anti-corruption laws and understanding how rules of evidence work. Next slide. You need to understand each court's rules of procedure. You need to understand the science and presidential cases that create acceptable expert testimony. <clears throat> if you're an investigator, whether for a company or for, a, uh, an out, for the government or, or for an outside party as an independent investigator, in the United States, you need to understand these three cases that determine whether expert testimony is admissible in a court. Fry, which goes back to the 1920s, Daubert and Kumo, which goes back into the uh, 1970s. 
there are cases in your countries that you need to know because it will determine whether or not your testimony is admissible or you will be precluded from testifying in trial. You need to understand the difference between criminology and criminalistics. Criminalistics is the actual investigation of a crime. Criminology is sociology applied to criminals. You need to understand, regardless of the country you live in, that everyone who goes to trial hates what we call the CSI effect. If you remember the TV shows, all six of them or whatever there were, of CSI, crime scene investigation, it has had an effect on all juries in that they expect to see what they see on TV and it doesn't exist. So beware of the CSI effect, don't get caught up in it. And then you need to understand for context and for being able to communicate the history of investigations. Next slide. You need, as an investigator, I don't care who you are and what you're investigating, you need to understand the difference between deductive and inductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning is top-down logic. It's foundationally a conclusion that is dependent on the arrangement of multiple premises that are assumed likely to be true. So you're looking at possibilities of commission of the crime. It is going from the top, the result of the actions, down to the core to identify the individual who committed it. So that's why I'm saying it's similar to moving from an element, which is composed of atoms, down to the atom. Inductive reasoning is going the other way. Inductive reasoning is what Sherlock Holmes would do. He would start at the least relatable item and then build up by observation and extrapolation to a conclusion and then take that and predict what happened and what the outcome was. All criminal investigations, again, be begin as exclusionary. So you will use one of these two me methodologies in your investigation. You just need to know which one you're using and what is the purpose. And you need to be able to explain this to uh, the people, whoever you're working with, as well as possibly juries. So know the difference between deductive reasoning, which is top down, and inductive reasoning, which is bottom up, starting perhaps with the perpetrator themselves. Next slide. In fraud and corruption investigations, case theory in, con, consists of the following. Remember I said you need to get the case theory from the attorney. <clears throat> the case theory is a hypothesis that's developed through data analysis. It is testing the hypothesis and it is working different iterations until conclusions are available. So iterations are part of the induction, inductive and deductive means of, of investigation because you're testing it. And you're work here, you're working it until you can reach a conclusion. So you're doing different modeling, you're exp evaluating different kinds of evidence, different testimonies, different circumstances to arrive, to arrive at your conclusion, your opinion that you're prepared to stake your reputation on in reaching a conclusion, whether or not it goes to trial. The process of all investigations begins with the case intake, in other words, the initial uh, waterfall at, the, uh, at contact, evaluating the allegations and filtering suspicions, the due diligence of discovery, the due diligence of chain of custody, the due diligence of, uh, in, invest, of interviews and investigation, documenting your examination, documenting your evidence, and being able to establish the predicates that will allow you to create exhibits that will prove your case to a trier of fact, to a judge or a jury, or to the company you work for. Next slide. Continuing with, with investigations, 
An external investigation will determine illicit payments. Can I get a witness? There are two types of witnesses, especially for internal investigations. There can be a confidential informant or a cooperator. The difference in the two terms is a confidential informant is someone who is has entered into an agreement with an investigator to provide information for any reason. A cooperator is someone who's already been caught committing a crime and is willing to cooperate with the investigator to get a reduced consequence, a reduced sentence, reduced financial damages. But a cooperator is literally someone who got caught a confidential informant is someone who may not even be involved in the crime, but is willing to provide the investigator with information. You have to be prepared to interview the primary suspect systematically and on more than one occasion, and understanding that you need to develop a relationship with that primary suspect. All good interrogations of any individual who is apprehended for suspected terrorism has been based on developing a relationship over a long period of time. Any detainee who could not have a relationship developed ultimately did not produce much evidence for the prosecutors in, in uh, any of the uh, countries that apprehended them. Reports, you need to be able to write a report. It needs to be a report to, that is consistent with the requirements of expert reports in your country. In the federal, government, federal cases in the United States, there are specific rules as to what an expert report must contain. Uh, each country has its own set of rules. You need to be familiar in whatever your, your jurisdiction is. And then ultimately recovery, trying to get something back that was lost, stolen, or otherwise converted by another party. Next slide. Now, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because you can look at this on your own. Critical thinking is part of that deductive and inductive reasoning. It's an attitude of being disposed to consider in a thoughtful way problems and subjects that come within range of your expertise. Critical thinking is what they teach in schools, in elementary schools, uh, in primary schools for children. Knowledge of methods of logical inquiry and reasoning, that's called investigation. It's called interviewing. And some skill in applying those methods. And then I put there, for those of you in the United States, is then there was Daubert, which changed the entire game as to what that level is in the United States for expert testimony. Next slide. Factors of solvability, being able to solve your case. Availability of witnesses as early as possible before they forget, before they change their minds, before somebody can talk to them. And the, great, the witness that is most overrated are eyewitnesses, but it's for the most part, they don't change the case. You have to identify your suspects, get the names. Eliminate those who are not suspects any longer, that exclusionary initial part of an investigation. Get geographic intelligence if necessary. That may apply to damages to buildings. It may apply to natural disasters. Get physiology intelligence. Develop identification data. Intelligence and data is the core of your decision. Next. In certain cases, transportation, time between, between locations is, it, is critical. Physical evidence before it's modified. Asset data, understanding what the MO, what the mod, modus operandi is. Uh, I've got physical evidence twice, I apologize. Uh, and then judgment, making your own judgment, being able to reach judgment. Understanding with electronic data that it must be pristine. It needs to be preserved at the date of 
of the event. And that means forensic copies, not just copying hard drives. Next slide. There are different types of intelligence that all investigators use. It just depends on what your issue is. Umint, SIGINT, GEOINT, FINANT, FINANT, uh, TECHINT, and SIBINT. Human intelligence, that's talking to people. Signal intelligence, that's uh, basically transmissions, like telephones, faxes, electronic communication. Geospatial, satellite intelligence. Financial intelligence, bank accounts. Uh, financial statements, technical intelligence, that is, is basically high tech analysis, and digital intelligence, cyber intelligence, uh, is exactly what it sounds like. It picks up all forms of communication that is done uh, on anything but paper. Next slide. A little bit more. Open source intelligence, what's available to the public without paying. Document intelligence, what can be uh, gleaned from reading specific documents, which documents are critical. Harmonized community description and coding system. This is 5,000 commodity groups that is built into certain programs. You won't see this often because it exists and it's not obvious. It's built into coding. Numerically integrated profiling system. This is a system that is based on, on algorithms and can identify criminals as well as crimes. Uh, in the United States, the Cust Custom Service and Florida International University developed systems for uh, financial intelligence Intelligence is not going to Wikipedia. It is not going to Google. It is other sources. It is not where somebody's giving you their opinion and doing your thinking. And last but not least, when it comes to intelligence, the dark web. Uh, do not explore the dark web with your computer. Get a crummy computer that you would like, you could just throw away. If you're gonna do any uh, investigation in the dark web, use a computer that is what we would call in a cellular phone, a burner. You're gonna use it strictly for that, nothing else. It will contain no other data other than what you discover from the dark web because the dark web will follow you home. Next slide. So who is your client? In the United States after 9-11, all financial institutions had to follow KYC, which is know your customer. You as, as an investigator, I don't care where you're the, an investigator, internally or externally, need to know who your client is, who your customer is. Is it the plaintiff? Is it the defendant? Is it the attorney? Is it the court? Is it the insurance company? Is it the third party? Is it your employer? It doesn't matter. You need to know who you answer to. And any agreements you have need to reflect that. Next slide. Working with attorneys, keep this in mind. They keep score. They like to win. If they don't win and you're part and they think you're part of the picture, they will not say nice things about you when they talk to their, their colleagues. So understand that attorneys keep score and for that matter, so do judges. Few attorneys understand financial concepts and issues, which is why they will always hire a financial investigator in financial cases. Therefore, you become part of that team. Losing is almost always the expert's fault. It is never the attorney's fault. Uh, they are not your, your lawyer. Do not think they will give you legal advice. Do not think they have your best interest at heart. Their best interest is their client first and foremost. Your fees, if you're an external expert, are your problem. It's not the lawyer's problem. They aren't going to protect you. And you are 100% responsible for the quality of your communication with everyone. No one is responsible for managing expectations other than you. You're responsible for 
how you're heard, you're responsible for what you hear. You're responsible for what you write. You're responsible for what people think you meant all the time. Next slide. There's a difference between privilege and confidentiality. It varies by, by uh, country, but basically understand confidential, confidentiality applies to information. Privilege ap applies to people. Privilege is never owned by an expert. It is only owned by a client and only clients can waive privilege or assert it. Experts cannot. Next slide. Your contract, as I said earlier, use that word, no other reference will protect you. You need to live by that contract. Forget about any other term. You need to get evergreen retainers if you're an external expert. In other words, you're gonna get a retainer that will be held until the last bill to protect yourself against allegations that your testimony will determine what you get paid or whether you get paid. You need to protect yourself. And the best way to do that is get a retainer up front that is held until the last bill, any excess is returned to the client. Do not testify if the client owes you a material fee, if it's a significant fee, because your independence will be challenged and always include alternative dispute resolution, mediation, uh, arbitration, or some other settlement form uh, prior to being uh, forced to go to court if there's a dispute between you and the client. Next slide. Fear is what you see and what you feel when you take your eye off the objective of your work. If you lose sight of what the goal is, if you lose sight of what the objective is, if you lose sight of what the agreement is, if you lose sight of what the damages were, what happened or who the players are, the minute you take your eye off any of the variables, that's when you start to feel fear. And that is within your control. Next slide. So, if fear is what you see and feel when you take your eye off the ball, courage is three words. It's commitment to doing the best job you can do based on your, your education, training, and experience. The third word for being courageous in the work you do is action. You act on your commitment. But there's a second word that comes between commitment and action. And that word is doubt. You have your doubts, but you do it anyway, based on your commitment to your client, to the result of your work, to your professionalism, to the people you work for and represent. And with that, I think we're done. All right, perfect. Thank you very much for the amazing session. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we have more than 1,000 delegates globally are attending our session and they are saying this is one of the very detailed sessions. You know, usually uh, our sessions, some, they give theories, you are giving practical uh, examples and some of them they are saying it's a, a, absolutely marvelous. This is the comments we are getting and they are really, uh, uh, would like to, I would like to thank you on behalf of all our uh, global delegates for your massive uh, experience uh, and you know how you were articulating all this concept in an easy way to uh, understand with an examples that make it alive. So thank you so much for being our guest speaker. Thank you and I apologize for my bad computer. <laughs> no issue. Uh, uh, do you know like uh, we have so many questions uh, but unfortunately we don't have time to go over them but at the same time, you know, so, so many of these questions are legal questions. So I advise you, if you want to actually find answers for these legal question, find a legal expert who can help you because uh, you don't want to actually uh, go and ask legal question to, to someone, especially which country you are in, what is the situation, laws will change. So you need to have the proper legal expert always. Like, like uh, when, when you listen to a, a medical show, they say, we don't give medical advice. So in that way, you take care of your health and you uh, ask your doctor. <laughs>
With that, I would like to conclude our global webinar. I would like to thank you all for joining us for this global webinar. This is the conclusion of our webinar and hopefully we will see you next week in our next subject.